the last journal of Simon Fraser from May 30th to June 10th, 1808. This journal was first prepared for publication by W.K. Lamb in 1960. The majority of this journal, namely the first entry on May 30th until the entry dated June 10th, parallels that of Fraser's other 1808 journal, chronicling Fraser and Company's celebrated 1808 journey down the Fraser River and back. As is the case with Fraser's first journal, this piece begins abruptly, mid-sentence. Monday, May 30th. Women of the Atna nation who were terrified at our appearance. Their languages were mutually unintelligible. But there being a young boy whose mother is of the Tahautam tribe who understands a little of the carrier language, we understood that they had sent couriers before and that several of their relations should be here in the course of the day and that it might be dangerous for us to proceed be, for they were apprised of our possible intentions. This, with expectation of procuring guides, induced us to remain and encamp with them, and in course of the day some Thatautans and other Atnas arrived. They all seemed peaceably inclined and even friendly and happy to see us. They say that they kept near the river purposely to see us, they having been informed by some carriers that we were to come to their lands this summer. One of them had seen Mr. Alexander Mackenzie and even served him as guide. And if we can judge from appearances, he has been a little spoiled. However, he was of some service to us, as it was through his means we were enabled to have any conversation with the others. I mean, the Atnas, whose language has not the least affinity with that of any of the different tribes with which I am acquainted. The few of them we saw at this place were of a diminutive size, but seemingly very active, and in their make more like the big men than carriers. They had bows and arrows, both extremely well made, which they laid down on coming to us. Most of their bows were of juniper or boxwood and cedar, and covered with the skin of the rattlesnake, which they say are numerous in this quarter, and their arrows are pointed with stone of the flint kind, but dark, and their clothing consisted of dressed leather, leggings and shoes, with robes of the chevrai, i.e. I, bucks, caribou, biche, i.e. does, and beaver skins, most of which were dressed in the hair. They represent the animals as very numerous, and the country in general is plains, in many places of which there is no wood, and a couple of our men who were hunting saw some chevrues though surrounded by people in several directions, which proves beyond doubt that they are numerous. And according to their accounts of the river, it is little better than a succession of falls and rapids, many of which are impassable and others very dangerous, but all of them said that none of them had been at or even near the sea, and it was their decided opinion that we ought to return back and take the same route Sir Alexander Mackenzie did, which, however, was far from our intentions, and being told that whatever obstacles might impede us, we were determined to proceed, they informed us that at the first rapid there was a great chief who had a slave that had been often there, I aim to the sea, and perhaps might be prevailed on to accompany us, particularly if we promised to come and pass the ensuing winter with them. All of them had heard of firearms, but few of them had ever heard the report of a gun and expressed a desire that we should fire ours, to which we complied and fired several guns and pistols which astonished them much, and on hearing the report they fell flat to the ground and informed us that all the Indians along this river were quiet and peaceable inclined and would come to us without an arm in their hands. However, we ought to be prudent and endeavour not to surprise any of them, as in that case they might be tempted to fire through fear. Those who came to see us from below were on horseback, but though animals are plenty, and the country in many places clear of wood, they do not use them to hunt, but use them to carry themselves and baggage, which is the chief cause of their not going much in canoes. At this place, unfortunately, we lost our swivel for firing it to make an impression on the Indians, though but moderately loaded, less than three gills of powder, it was shattered to pieces, and wounded the man that fired at Gagnier, which accident was perhaps fortunate to us, it being cracked in many places of old. 
Was it to break amongst a large band of Indians, the consequence might be fatal. Tuesday, May 31st, we started at half-past five with two Indians on board, it, that is to say, an Atna and a Towton, to go where there are several others a short distance below. I had no information in addition to what I was informed yesterday. Continued the same course with yesterday two miles. A house on the right and islands near the lower end, and a small one on the left. South seventy east half mile, south fifteen east one and a half miles, an isle on the left. South fifty-five east one mile, islands in the right, south twenty east two miles, south seventy east one mile, south seventy east one, and a quarter miles. In this course is a rapid, and at the beginning of the course is a large island, in the middle of the river, a white cliff on right, east one quarter mile, north seventy east two and a half miles. In the course are rough cliffs of greyish colour on left, and a high but not long one on right divided into two, and near the end a small island on left, south sixty east one third mile. The hills and banks have a romantic and grotesque shape, south thirty east one half mile. Here we found Indians on the left on very high hills at the head of a strong rapid called La Grande de Charge, i.e. the Soda Creek Canyon. All the Indians came to see us near the river and were very friendly to us. They brought us dried salmon and three different kinds of roots with which they regaled us all. After having inquired several times for the slave that knows the country below, he at last was introduced to us by the chief's desire. I immediately got the two cloths spread out to get a chart of the river drawn by the slave, which he undertook, but seemingly knew but little of its situation, as he delineated nothing but what an elderly man, I believe a relation of the chief, ensigned. The chief himself spoke much and paid particular attention to us, and informed us of the Indians being peaceable, and that we had nothing to apprehend from them, though some of the tribes or nations below were at enmity with them, that they would not hurt white people, but receive them on the palms of their hands. But notwithstanding, he said that he would accompany us all the way in case that anything might happen to us, that from his age, influence, and acquaintance with the country and natives below, that he could protect us from any imminent danger. Previous to this, I inquired if an Indian could be had to accompany us, and I believe that old man's principal reason for a company accompanying us is that we may return early to establish a post upon his lands. All these Indians are fond of smoking tobacco, and they have a kind of weed, which they mix with fat, which serves as a substitute for tobacco. The chief produced a pipe which was procured from the lower part of this river. We lost much time in speaking to the Indians, but got the canoes ran down the rapids, and part of the loading carried while we were busy getting information and procuring guides. Here we left four bales of salmon under the care of the chief's brother, and on our departure he told me to stop till he brought me some leather for making shoes. He returned in about twenty minutes with a large and well-dressed buck deer skin and a beaver skin, which he made me a present of in recommending me to take good care of the chief, his brother. I told him I would pay particular attention to his brother, and that he himself would be pleased with me on my return, for his present as well as attention to us all. All the Indians of this place were very civil to us. They agreed with the others that animals are plenty, and the navigation of the river in many places impracticable. After which we set off, accompanied by the chief, a slave of his, and our former guide, the latter I now call interpreter, he being the only one we can understand on board, to the lower end of the carrying place afoot. South one half mile, south thirty east one mile. The last two courses are a continual strong rapid, and although the canoes were not all half loaded, they took water. At the lower end is a rocky island, and all along the river is much contracted. Here we met a band of about eighteen men that we did not see before, shook hands with all of them, and explained the cause of our passing through their country, 
which in appearance highly pleased them, after which we embarked and started. South twenty, west and a half mile, very steep banks on right, and a small river, i.e. probably Hawks Creek, on left and thick wood on right, small epinet, i.e. spruce. Still high, sandy banks on left, but in some places wooded, S30. East one and a half miles, rapids continue, and in this course is a rocky island in middle, grotesque banks or pinnacles on right, south five, west three and a quarter miles. In this course is another strong rapid, and the banks on right continue until near the end of course. South twenty, east one third mile. The last course, but one may be called continual rapid. There are almost continual banks on both sides of the river and the wood, which is generally cypress, is scanty and but of a small growth. Neither does the soil appear to be good, being generally sand on gravel. Near the end of this course is a very steep sandy banks and a rapid but not strong. South twenty, east three and a half miles. South forty, east one mile. Near the end of the last course is a small river, i.e. Williams Lake Creek, on left, and the last course is a continual rapid, with high banks in left and covered with wood, and the river in most places does not exceed one hundred or one twenty yards wide, south ten, west three-quarter mile, south half mile, strong rapid and lure all along this course, and rocks of bluish colours on both sides, south twenty, east one and three-quarters miles. In this course is rock on left, and a rapid and house on right above the hills, southeast with a rapid and rock on left, while a high hill of shape like the side of an old castle appears ahead two miles, south fifteen, east one and a quarter miles. Here is a long and dangerous rapid, which is called Rapid du Trou, from a hole that appears in the perpendicular rock on the right side, and we debarked to visit it, and before that was done night came on, and we encamped for the night. There is also houses at the upper end on the right side. It blew amazing hard, all from the southward, which rendered our progress not only tedious but dangerous, for when the wind caught hold of the canoes and the many whirlpools we passed, there was no such thing as managing them, so that every moment we were in danger of going to the bottom, and in many places there was no such thing as hunting on shore. In visiting the rapids we perceived some of the natives on the right shore, but I believe we were not observed by them. Wednesday, June 1st. At an early hour this morning all hands were up, and soon after the natives appeared in several directions, some of which came to us. However, by 5 a.m., Mr. Stewart, myself, and six men went to visit the rapid again, while the others remained to take care of the baggage and canoes. We found the rapid to be about one and a half mile long, and the rocks on both sides of the river contract themselves in some places, to either within thirty or forty yards of one another, the immense body of water passed through them in a zigzag and turbulent manner, forming numerous gulfs and whirlpools of great depths. However, it was deemed impossible to carry the canoes. It was the general opinion that they ought to be run down. Indeed, there was no other alternative than either that or leaving them here. Mr. Stewart remained at the lower end with Lagarde and Waka to watch the natives while the others were running the canoes down. Though they appeared peaceable, it would not be prudent to allow the people to run down the canoes under such a steep and rocky bank without having a guard above, as it would be in the Indians' power to sink them all to the bottom. Were they, the Indians, ill-inclined? And I returned to the upper end to see the people embark. Accordingly, five of the best men embarked with only about eleven or twelve pieces. They immediately entered the rapid, but the whirlpools below the first cascade made them wheel about, and they remained a considerable time without being able to move one way or the other, and every moment on the brink of eternity. However, by the utmost exertions they went down two others, till between that and the fourth, which is the most turbulent of the eddies and whirlpools, the current caught hold of the canoes, and spite of them brought it ashore in a moment, and fortunately it was it happened so, 
or that they were not able to get out again into the current, for had they got down the fourth cascade, it would have been more than likely they would have remained there. Seeing it impossible to go any further, they unloaded upon a small point in a very steep and high and long hill. Upon my way down, to see what had become of the people, I met Mr. Stewart coming up, who informed me of their situation, he having seen them from the lower part of the rapids. We went down immediately to the place they were thrown ashore, which we reached with much difficulty on account of the steepness of the banks. I often supported my self by running my dagger into the ground to hold myself by it. Happy we were to find all hands safe after such imminent danger. With much difficulty, a road was dug into the hill with a hoe about the breadth of one foot wide and a line tied to the bow of the canoe, and it was brought up an extraordinary bad and long bank. Had any of those that carried the canoe missed their step, all would have tumbled into the river in spite of those that hauled the line. And when that was effected, the baggage was brought up, and by the time the remainder of the canoes were unloaded, night came on. More of the natives came to us in the course of the day, to the number of upwards of forty men, none of which carried arms. And if we may judge from appearance, they were very happy to see us, and among them were some from a different tribe that inhabited the banks of a considerable river that falls into this from the right, some distance below this place. They call themselves Chilkotins, and are different from the Atna in language and manners, but resemble the carriers, of which they are a tribe. In both groups we saw about sixty men, Indians, on this side of the river, and there were many on the other side of the river that could not cross, and are continually calling out to us to go for them. But as they could not render us any service, we have other things to attend to. And besides, in the present state of the water, it would be dangerous to cross the river at this place. All agree in saying the navigation of the river is impracticable, and indeed, according to my own ideas in the present state of the water, which has risen eight feet perpendicular in the four and twenty hours that we have been here, it is not possible to proceed in canoes all along, though in low water the navigation may be practicable. As far as I have been as yet, there are no falls, and I have ran down stronger rapids in appearance. But then the tremendous gulfs and whirlpools which are peculiar to this river is ready every moment to swallow a canoe with all its contents and the people on board, and the high and perpendicular rocks render it impossible to stop the canoe or get on shore. Even was it stopped, so that in the present state of the water I pronounce it impracticable. This rapid did not appear half so strong when visited from the top of the hills as what it is. But though the navigation is dangerous and difficult by water, the Indians inform us that there is a good road along the river upon the hills all the way to the confluence of another large river, i.e. the Thompson, that flows in from the left. From thence the navigation is good to the sea. They say that there are rapids, that the perpendicular rocks terminate, and that they sleep only four nights with horses loaded to go to that fork. I could wish that their report be true. Great as the distance is, it would not be more expeditious, but more safe to leave our canoes here and proceed by the land at once. But it being late, the course we are to take could not be finally determined, and all hands went to bed without placing a watch. All being not only sleepy but tired, and all the Indians having previously reiterated, we apprehended no danger. Thursday, June 2. More strangers came to our camp, and passed the best part of the day with us. The men were employed taking the remainder of the baggage in a canoe up the hill. On account of the navigation being difficult, we leave two canoes here, which will serve for our return. We also got a cachet made to leave part of our baggage and provisions in, in order to lighten the two canoes that continue the route. And besides, some people will go by land with as many horses as we can procure from the Indians. They do not like either to sell or lend their horses. However, we have been promised three, and they are gone for more. The Indians were against our continuing the navigation on account of their being apprehensive for our safety, 
but now that we require horses to go by land, they give us encouragement to go by water. We got several charts drawn of the river, but by all it appears bad, and some of the men are not willing to go in canoes. I imagine they have not got the better of the fright they had running down this rapid yesterday, but notwithstanding we shall try it tomorrow. Friday, June 3rd. The night last passed, many of the Indians passed the night at our camp. In the morning I got them to draw another chart of the river, which Mr. Stewart got explained, and took them down in writing, by which the road appears more practicable than by the information they gave us before. Accordingly, I have changed my plans of yesterday, and settled everything to start with three canoes. We took one up the hill this morning for that purpose. In this manner, tied the line to the bow, which was hauled by one of our men and seven Indians, canoe upside down, and the remainder of the people carried it upon their shoulders. With the help of Messrs. Stewart, Cosnell, and myself, it was got up in the same manner as we brought up the other yesterday. The Indians have amused us this two days past with the promise of bringing us plenty of horses to pass our baggage in the portage, or to go by land to the large river that falls into this below the rapids, but they brought only four. But their women passed about fifteen pieces of provisions, and etc. Mm -hmm. The men do not carry, though some of them brought pieces up the hill yesterday, and as far as I can judge, the women are much accustomed to laborious work. The men in height are generally from five feet six inches to six odd feet, and the great part of them are above the middle size, but of a slender make, but active like, and as far as I can judge more industrious than the natives this side of the mountains generally are. They are well clothed in leather, which consists of only a robe, a pair of leggings and shoes, with sometimes a cap of an oval make but more generally a circle of bark, cedar, dyed of different colours tied round their head, and their bodies are besmeared with grease or oil and red earth, while their face is generally painted with different colour. They seem to run and move about much, and some of them have been across the mountains, as they seem acquainted with buffalo, for on seeing our powder horns they immediately observed that they were of that animal and a wounded buffalo being painted on the stern of D. They named it, and said that they had seen such on the other side of the mountains when they were upon a war party. They likewise say that they heard of white people having been down the first large river that flows into this on the left, i.e. the Thompson, but whether it had been Captain Lewis or some of the Fort de Prairie people we cannot determine. They seem communicative, but whether it be the fault of our interpreter, the Towton Indian, we have, I cannot say. But we can learn nothing certain, particularly regarding the river from them, for sometimes they represent it entirely impracticable, while in others they say it is navigable, though there are many rapids and several portages, one of which is two days' march long. There they say that we will be obliged to leave our canoes and go afoot, it being impassable on account of the many rapids and the rocks being cut perpendicular on both sides of the river. A great part of the day was employed in getting information while they brought up an amazing steep bank upwards of 450 feet high, all the baggage, and afterwards made a cache where we will leave anything that we will not be able to take from here. For all along until the evening, the Indians represented the river as worse and worse, and from what we had seen of it ourselves it was thought impracticable by water, and the Indians amused us with the hopes of lending a sufficiency of horse to carry everything indispensably necessary to the confluence of this and the first large river from the left, i.e. the Thompson, where the rapids terminated. But as they brought only four, which would not be sufficient, even with what the men could carry of salmon, leaving other necessaries out of the question, for fifteen or twenty days, it was determined to carry the canoes in this portage and proceed by water at all hazards, for were we only to get down a dozen miles it would be so much gained, and we will then have the same advantage of going by land as now. 
this plain few of the men, particularly Lacerte, relished for the imminent dangers there were in this rapid renders them diffident and backward to attempt again for a passage by water. However, in consequence of this resolution, a road was made same as yesterday in this hill, and in the same manner and by force of people another canoe was brought up the hill. By the time this was effected the sun was set and all hands tired. Many of the natives passed the night with us at our camp, and though no danger was apprehended, a watch was placed. Part of the Indians amused themselves, a great part of the day, at play. Their play of hazard, at least the one they played today, resembled that of the Rocky Mountain Meadow Indians. By means of a small stick, bone, stone, or anything else of a small size, which under their robe they hide in one of their hands, and afterwards place them in Kimbu, while they continue humming a song, which is the only one I observed among them, and either win or lose as their antagonist points out the hand that contains the mark or not. The water rose about three or four feet since last night. Early the morning all hands went to open a road and carry the two canoes to the other end of the portage, and during the interval, which was long, I spoke again to the Indians about the river, and got another chart drawn of it, and particular pains taken to get everything explained, by which it appears that the river, according to the present accounts, is not so bad as before represented, which induced me to change my plans of yesterday, which was to proceed with two canoes by water, manned by four men each, while Mr. Stewart, accompanied by Mr. Quesnel and the remainder of the people, would continue by land with what horses we could procure here. But neither the Indians like to lend or sell their horses, which is perhaps the reason of their giving a different account of the river to what they did yesterday and on former occasions. But at all events, as we could not procure horses enough to be of much use, and as by that plan we would unavoidably have been obliged to separate company, it will be more prudent and better to continue all in canoes, as the third can follow where two can go, with only this exception, that they will not be so well manned, and the bouts of the third canoe are novices. It is true that to have two canoes here might be of service on our way back, but to proceed is my present object. And if fortunate enough in that, we will always find out way back, for to gain that end every person will be interested, which perhaps is not so much the case at present. And in consequence of this last determination, another canoe was brought up the hill in the same manner as the one of last night, and the Indians gave a hand to carry the pieces over the portage, which is bad, constantly on the declivity of a steep hill, amongst rocks, and often up and down steep and long hills, and upwards of three thousand paces long. The course by water is south seal east one mile, south five east one and a half miles, and here we encamped for the night. The people were much fatigued, and well they might. One of the horses lent us was led by one of our own men, loaded with two bales of fish and Mr. Stewart's desk. But in passing, the declivity of a rock, the horse tumbled down the precipice and was near being killed, however receiving no damage excepting breaking Mr. Stewart's desk, losing some papers and medicines, we left about one thousand salmon in the cache at the upper end of the portage, a little gum and watap. The Indians wanted us to leave all our fish there, contending that it would be loading ourselves to no purpose to take such a quantity of bad salmon with us, and assuring us that the natives below would give us plenty of provisions, askiatigs and tlacabanes, suchanks and etc. It is very probably that the natives below have plenty of provisions, but then it cannot be depended upon. I know well from experience what it is to be out of provisions and to depend on such vague report, and while we have a salmon remaining, bad as they are, there will be nothing impossible for us to do. They also said that in a couple of days we would get to places where animals were so plentiful that we would kill as many as we would require, but no inducements of theirs could make us act contrary to our own ideas. These Indians... I mean the Atnars, appear very friendly, but not of that hospitable disposition that the carrier tribes are of. However, I asked one of them for a few good salmon, as ours were bad. 
He soon brought me twenty which were well cured and amazing fat. There is a vast difference between the salmon that are taken here and that which are caught amongst the carriers. The Atnas does not seem to work the salmon much. As there are plenty of animals upon their lands, they do not take much pains about their houses. Indeed, I saw none amongst them that deserve any other name than a shade. They pass the winter in subterraneous houses or lodges, which are square, with a square hole upon the top for the smoke, by which they go out and in, by the assistance of notches made in a length of wood, which serves for steps. Saturday, June 4th. Before everything was ready this morning, it was late, however, at six o'clock a.m., we were upon the water. Last night another Indian promised to embark with us on account of his being better acquainted with the rapids and lower part of the river than the old chief. Accordingly we agreed, but this morning he would not embark, through fear of the rapids and bad places we had to pass. Previous to our embarking, one of them brought and returned a pistol, which Mr. Quesnel lost yesterday on horseback, which is a singular instance of their honesty. Indeed, all the time we were in the portage, though many things were loose and that they had many opportunities, we did not perceive that they touched anything. They differ widely in both customs and manners from any tribe that I am acquainted with this side of the Rocky Mountains, they do not burn their dead, but bury them and arrange their tomb neatly with splintered wood in a conic four, it, that is to say, round about twenty-four feet circumference below, and joining above in the form of a sugar loaf and tide. Their prisoners of war are nominated slaves. The backs of their bows are covered with the skin of the rattlesnake in addition to the usual material. They make fire by friction. Our first course, southeast half mile. Here we stopped on right to speak to a band of Indians, some of which we did not see before. On left is a steep bank which is upwards of eight hundred perpendicular feet in height and appears in the shape of a pyramid, east one and a half miles. In this course are high and steep rocks above the first range of hills, which are fine and variegated on both sides and at the end is a rocky mountain of considerable elevation. On left, the current is amazing strong and full of whirlpools and tremendous to behold, south twenty east to a rapid and rock on the left one quarter mile, south one and a half miles. In this course steep and rough banks of a sand on gravel on left, south twenty-five east with a conical rock ahead to a strong rapid one mile. Here we debarked to visit, but ran down the canoes, and it was not necessary to make a portage. There is a fine road, and no hills on right. A few pieces were carried to lighten the perseverance. Southeast to another rapid, but not dangerous, while another conical rock on right appeared ahead one mile. South ten west to where there is a subterranean house on left three-quarter mile, same course quarter mile, South ten, east quarter mile, and both courses a continuation of rapid, but safe. Gravel banks, or debouli, i.e., a slide on right, and a rock, but not high on left, while the hills on both sides continue broken, as it were, and only trees here and there of small growth, generally cypress with juniper or red cedar, I do not know which. South forty, east one and a quarter miles. In this course is a high and steep hill or bank, on right with steep banks on left near the end. Rock on right, there are deep holes, through some of which we see daylight, on the other side. South ten, east one third mile. South twenty, west, to a rapid half mile. In this course are some leard, i.e. poplar, and tremble, i.e. aspen. Southwest one mile, high and steep banks on right with rocks on left, and the whole course a constant strong rapid. Southwest, a considerable strong rapid one and a quarter miles. South ten, west one and a half miles. There being Sunday, June fifth, fine weather. We were upon the water at five o'clock in the morning and steered southwest quarter mile, south eighty, west one mile. Strong rapid along this course, south fifty-five, west three-quarter mile, 
strong rapid and steep rock on left in this course, south 70, west 2 and a quarter miles, south 75, west half mile, banks of a very grotesque shape on right, south 40, west quarter mile, a small low point on left and a small river, i.e. risk a creek on right, south 15, east quarter mile, the hills have a beautiful appearance, south 50, east one and a half miles, south quarter mile, south 35, west one mile. An ugly e-cove on right of this course, south 20, west quarter mile, a rapid, south 15, east one mile, south 20, east one third mile, south one mile, south 15, west one half mile, south 20, east one mile, south 10, east three quarter mile, south 50, east one and a quarter miles. Here we unloaded on the left side of a strong rapid and carried all the baggage and canoes over a point which has very steep and high banks of about two-third of a mile long, and incredible it is to relate the trouble and misery the people had in performing that office. On debarkation we found the horns of that animal, the Tautans called the Sassian, and the Mayatwe of the Crees, or Rocky Mountain Ram. And at this end, when everything was brought over, we tapped our small keg of shrub, which induced us to call this portage de baril, and gave all hands a dram. The course by water in this portage is about south five east half mile, and the rocks contract themselves to within thirty yards of one another, and at the lower end is a rocky island on the left shore. It is terrible to behold the rapidity and turbulency of the immense body of water that passes in this narrow gut and no less to the numerous gulfs and whirlpools it forms, constantly striking from one rock to another. The rocks are amazing, high and craggy, particularly on the right side, and the water in a manner seem to have forced a passage under them, and flows out here and there in numerous whirlpools and eddies that surpass anything of the kind I ever saw before. In this carrying place, from the time we debarked to our re-embarking again, was upwards of four hours. On setting off, our first course was south ten, east one, and a quarter miles. In this last course are many rocks, particularly on the left, but little wood to be seen, south one and a quarter miles. Near the end of this course is a considerable river Wackens, i.e. the Chilcotin River, on right, with an island at its mouth, and I suppose to see the river which Sir Alexander Mackenzie supposed himself to be higher up, and the one he passed in his way across the mountains in his way to the Pacific in 1793. It is likewise the residence of the Chilcotins, a tribe of the carriers, and by all accounts is very rapidous and full of shoots. Moose, red deer, and chevro, and beaver are likewise said to be very numerous in that quarter, and the natives have horses. Southeast one-third mile, south 80 east one and two-third miles. In this course is a high bank, or debulis on left, of a very irregular shape. But there are so many varieties along this river that however willing I might be, I am not possessed of sufficient abilities to describe it. At the end of this course is a long and strong but not dangerous rapid, for after visiting it all the canoes were run down without any accident, but the driftwood rendered it more dangerous than otherwise it would be. The next course, south forty, east one and a half miles. In this last course is another rapid, and afterwards the river turned to south twenty, west quarter, to another strong rapid, and there being a strong eddy, we turned the canoes against it with a line. Here we debarked to visit the rapid, in which the current is very swift and violent, the canoes were run down, the first at six and the others at five men each. The road on shore is difficult, it being along the declivity of a steep and high bank without anything to get hold of. I forced myself so much in this place to get up a hill that I feel a violent pain in my groins which prevent me from being able to walk any distance. The course by water is south two-thirds mile, and at the end is a very high and steep sandy bank on right with cliffs opposite resembling broken pedestals or chimneys. South twenty east one quarter mile. South east one and a quarter miles. South fifty east one and a quarter miles. In this course are ugly sandy banks and hillocks on right and very irregular on right, with but little wood on either except entirely above. South fifteen east three quarter mile. 
south 60 east one and a half miles. In this course the hills are less high on right, I mean near the waterside. South 10 west three quarter mile. Fine but very irregular on both sides, I mean hills. Here is a strong rapid but fine going. South 35 east one and three quarters mile. At end of this course are fine white rocks in the shape of well-made pedestals with a head and at beginning of next course south sixty east half mile are curious banks with very irregular pointed heads all this course is a constant and strong rapid but the passage nowise dangerous south ten east three quarter mile the banks though continually changing are such as i am not well able to describe they are very irregular grown with short grass scorched by the sun and very often consists of sand or stone with but very little wood. Here is another strong rapid. South 60 east one third mile. Still a rapid. South 50 east one and a third mile. South 10 east one and a third miles. South east one mile. In this and last course are strong rapids. South 5 east one mile. Very irregular and grotesque banks south east one mile with rocks on both sides perpendicular, and saw Chevreau on the left. South one quarter mile, south thirty-five east one quarter mile, south twenty east one and a half miles. The rapids, which are constant, are so swift that there is no time to look about. South fifty east three miles. In this course we encamped on the right shore at half past seven p.m. The current throughout the day ran with amazing velocity, and on this and the last course our situation was really dangerous, being constantly between steep and high banks where there was no possibility of stopping the canoe, and even could it be stopped there would be no such thing as going up the hills, so that had we suddenly come upon a cascade or bad rapid, not to mention falls, it is more than likely that all of us would have perished, which is much to be apprehended. In the morning the weather was clear and very warm, but afterwards cloudy, and in the afternoon it blew hard at intervals from the southward. The berries in this place are much advanced, and we saw wild lint, wormwood, and some other kind of wood and shrubs which we did not know. The water had lowered greatly since yesterday night. Monday, June 6th, fine weather early in the morning. La Certe and some others were sent to examine the river so that we may not suddenly come upon a cascade or dangerous rapid in this narrow gut, but I believe they did not go far, and indeed the number of hills and precipices render it not only difficult but almost impossible to walk, even in the plains. Upon the top of the hills there are so many thistles that all hands have the sole of their feet full of them, and being almost continually when on shore upon rocks and stones, a pair of shoes does not last a whole day to some of us without piercing. At seven o'clock we were upon the water, continued our course of last night to the end, and afterwards started south twenty east quarter mile. Here is a small low point and a river, i.e. Churn Creek on right, with irregular sandy banks or hillocks on both sides. South fifteen west one mile southeast one and three-quarter miles. Near the beginning of this course there is a strong rapid on right, but safe on left. South sixty east three-quarter mile, with a steep and craggy rock on right. At the end of this course we saw a ram on left, and our next course south thirty east one and a quarter miles, south fifty east one mile, south twenty east three-quarter mile, south seventy east quarter mile. Here is a strong rapid with rocks on right, and our next course was south forty east two miles. Here is a strong rapid which we debarked at to visit it, a shade for salmon fishery on left, but ran down the canoes. Our next course was south sixty east one third mile, north eighty east one and a quarter miles, south fifty east three quarter mile, to a rocky point on left and rapid. The next was south ten west, with a snow clad mountain ahead on right, and our guide says it is the highest chain of mountains from here to the sea, two miles. 
In these two last courses but one there is real pine poplar and a small kind of birch on the chain of mountains last mentioned. Seffleur, i.e. whistlers or marmots, are plenty by our guide's account. South five, west one and a half mile here, and at last we landed on the right shore, found a strong rapid and cascade which we did not venture to run down. Mr. Stewart and myself went immediately to visit it, accompanied by La Certe. The upper end could easily be made, that is to say, we could carry the canoe or take it down with the line, and everything else carried across a short point. But the lower end is bad betwixt steep rocks on both sides, and no possibility to carry. Soon after Mr. Stewart and myself returned to the canoes and sent Mr. Quesnel with six men across the opposite side to visit and look for a place to carry, as it appeared to be less steep upon that side of the river. Mr. Quernell returned in about three hours after, with information that they were entirely across the point below the rapid upon a well-traced road, and that the hills were high and steep to take up the canoes, and as soon as they were upon the top, that they went down as steep as they went up, upon this side all the way to the water side, which Mr. Quesnell reckoned at about four miles' distance after which all hands crossed to the east side and encamped for the night, where we come to the determination before we would attempt crossing the canoes in this long and difficult portage, or risk running them down the rapid, to send a party first to visit and examine a considerable distance lower down the river, as the Indians tells us that it is impossible to proceed any further than this with our canoes, on account of it being a constant succession of falls and rapids, and the banks being perpendicular on both sides of the river, and no place to stop at until below the next nation, which they call Asketes, but that we would not take more than two days to go there by land loaded. But as it is my object to determine the practicability of the navigation of this river, though it would be much more safe and expeditious to go by land, we shall not leave our canoes as long as there will be any possibility of taking them down by water or land. But should the passage be as bad as the old chief our guide says it is, and should it not be worth while taking the canoes any further, I would as soon leave them here as a few miles further down. To ascertain this, Mr. Stewart is settled to go and visit the river far down tomorrow, accompanied by Mr. Quesnell and five of our best men, Waka, and three of our Indians. In the course of the afternoon we saw several animals, but those that went after them could not approach any excepting Lagarde, who wounded a ram. Tuesday, June 7th. Early in the morning the gentlemen and men were off to visit the river. I employed the remainder of the people, making and mending shoes and doing other necessary work. Lagarde and Baptiste went after the wounded ram. They saw, but could not overtake it. Cloudy weather and a shower of rain in the afternoon with strong wind. Wednesday, June 8th fine weather, and the heat very intense. I got all the salmon properly tied again, which diminishes very fast. We have no more than twenty-five hundred remaining, and many of that bad. However, our Indian guides say that we can have more than what will be required, that all the nations below, as far as they know, have plenty, and that the large salmon coho already begin to come up. Mr. Stewart and all the people returned from below, at about three o'clock in the afternoon, after having been down to the Rapide Couvert, as the Indians call it, about eighteen miles distance. The rocks are rugged and steep in many places, which rendered our passage dangerous along the declivity of those rocks and steep banks, but by perseverance we traced the river down all the way to where we returned, and in that distance, though the current continued amazing strong all the way, there was but one dangerous rapid, and in the hills, there was a steep rock, or bank of considerable elevation and length, resembling an immense pile of natural architecture, far surpassing anything that ever entered the idea of mortal man, and in what, though without any regularity, all the different orders seemed to have been combined, which created a pleasing and awful sensation to behold and consider the superiority of God's works over those formed by the hands of man but to describe what I have often felt in these romantic and wild regions where nature appears in all its forms, 
is far above my slender abilities, even was I possessed of more leisure and materials than I am. To describe everything as it would be worthy of the greatest philosophers, and would take up a considerable time without anything else to attend to. At the rapide couvert we perceived Indians, and our guide and interpreter went to them. They told Mr. Quesnel that they were not of the Atna, but of the Ascatai nation, and had I been present myself at that time, I would accompany them, but I was at the waterside visiting, and after my joining the others I sent down La Serte to the waterside to visit a little further, and during that interval two young men came towards us, one of which joined us, and after a short stay begged leave to return. His language was entirely unintelligible to us. However, by the signs he made we understood that our guide and interpreter were at the tents, and that he himself had killed some mouton and would return to us again with the meat. I was here again prevented from going to their lodges from having promised La Serre to wait his return, which was late, and we encamped. We remained this morning until 7 a.m. in expectation of some of the natives would join us, but we saw no appearance of any of them. Therefore we returned to the canoes by a different route, for we ascended the hills, which are amazing high and long. But once above, the country is even in most places, clear of wood, and has a beautiful appearance. At half-past six p.m. we started to make another piece in canoes, as the river is navigable as far as the people went down. The canoes crossed over to the other side of the river, and were taken down the first cascade with the line, and the remainder ran, which was very strong. I myself, with Messrs. Stewart, Quenel, and Baptiste, went down a foot upon the left shore by a well-beaten path, and instead of four miles, at most it is not more than two. The course by water is about south sixteen west one and a half miles. Here Mr. Stewart's compass being deranged, I lent him mine. Our next course was south five east one and a quarter miles. In these last courses is a large déboulise, i.e. slide, on right. South twenty east two and a half miles. In this course the rocks are much contracted, and there is a large and long rapid with many whirlpools, and at end of the course a déboulise on both sides, with craggy rock hills ahead. South forty east one and a third miles. In this course is another, but not strong, rapid. South thirty east, three-quarter mile. It is here the immense hills of natural architecture begins, but it is not much seen from the waterside. Another rapid, but not strong in this course, south twenty east one mile. A small rivulet, and very craggy on its right. And another stronger rapid, south five east one mile. At beginning of this course, another large rapid and a large déboulise, with very grotesque banks of irregular shape, south sixty east one and a third miles, fine going and easy to debark on both sides, north three-quarter mile. A steep and very craggy rock on right and déboulis on left, but fine going with a small groove on left, southeast two-third mile. The river is wide and fine going, east one and a third miles. At beginning of this last course we encamped upon the right shore, and the people unloaded and gummed the canoes. Some of them fired several shots at an eagle without effect, but they took the young ones out of the nests, which was in the top of a tree. It appears that Kesh comes up, as the tail of one was found in the nest with the leg of mouton. Berries poire are much advanced, notwithstanding that the mountains are very high, and snow to be seen upon them. Wood is scanty all over and stunted, but more pine than any other wood. Plain of small growth, with many different kinds of the willow, elder, and some of the birch species, and some other I do not know. Thistles of a diminutive growth are so very plenty that no shoes prevents their picking the feet. Wild flax is very plenty, of which the natives manufacture their thread and fishing tackle. Thursday, June 9. This morning all hands arranged their arms and dressed themselves. And our two young men, interpreters, having only a beaver and deerskin robes, I gave them each a blanket and a brayette, i.e. breeches 
that they may appear decent and Englishified amongst the strangers. It was 7 a.m. when we embarked and called this place Campamon Daigle, i.e. Eagle Camp, started south 55. East three-quarter mile from end of camp of last night, the hills of left are low and really fine, south five east one mile, south seventy east one half mile and one quarter mile. A strong rapid in this course and very high and grotesque banks of uneven shape, south thirty-five east one and a half miles, south fifty-five east. A strong rapid and rivulet, i.e. French Bar Creek, on right one quarter mile, south fifteen east three quarter mile short. North 50 East, a strong rapid, one-third mile. Here is an amazing strong rapid, i.e. French Bar Canyon, which is the one called Le Rapide Couvert, so long talked of. The rocks contract themselves to within a very short distance of one another, and this is the narrowest place we have yet passed, and the rocks above project themselves still farther out, and the water between passes with the greatest velocity of anything I ever saw, and the waves are high, but then the whirlpools and eddies are not so strong as in some places we have passed. But yet, according to my ideas, this is the most dangerous place we hitherto passed. Yet rather than carry the canoes over steep hills, after visiting properly, the people were allowed to run them, the canoes down. But the perseverance, I, one of the canoes, having remained above while the others were run down, at six men each, was partly unloaded and four pieces carried. The canoes were fortunately ran down without any accident, but the men had a terrible fright, and us that were at the lower end of the rapid were in great anxiety waiting the event, which was an awful sight to see, the canoes wheeling about, and every moment in extreme danger of dashing against the rocks, and from above appeared no longer than salto canoes. Indeed, this rapid should always be a portugais. The rocks are amazing high and perpendicular on both sides, but... On the left they are upwards of two hundred feet above the level of the water. In the last course upon the left side of the river, we saw Indians upon the hills, those that Mr. Stewart and those that were with him saw the day before yesterday. The course of this rapid by water is about south seventy east quarter mile and south twenty west three quarter mile. From the time of our debarking at the upper end till our embarking at the lower end of this rapid was three hours, and our next course, south 30 east one mile, still a rapid, with a fine low grave, i.e. sandy beach, on right. Here, on seeing the natives on the left shore, we debarked, and Mr. Stewart had meridian altitude 122, 58 one half. The few Indians we saw were of the Atnar nation, and with them were our old guide and interpreter. These Indians gave a worse description of the river than any we have had yet. For by their charts, it is nothing but a succession of falls and rapids surrounded by perpendicular rocks, and they blame us for not leaving our canoes sooner, when there was a good road by land to the next nation, and say that in spite of what we can do, we will be obliged to leave them close by and go by land and the road bad. Having collected all the information we could, at one and three quarters p.m., we re-embarked, accompanied by another elderly man, exclusive of our former guide and interpreter, and steered south sixty east half mile. A strong bature, i.e. sand or gravel bar, on left near beginning of the course, with a very high and rugged rock, south fifty east one mile. Both this and last course is a rapid but no wise dangerous, and there is a little wood on both sides, south seventy east, with snow on left two-thirds of a mile, and two conical rocks on right ahead of us, and near end, of course, is a small rivulet, i.e. Big Bar Creek, on left, north seventy east one, and a third miles. In this course is a fine beach on left, with small shrubs and no great currents, south eighty east, one half mile. Here were ducks, the first seen in a long time. South eighty east, a very strong rapid with perpendicular rugged rocks on both sides, half mile. South sixty east, one and a half miles. In this course the rocks are still more ugly on left, for the mountains are close to the river and steep.
with no interval of even ground to the top. South 55, east one and a half miles, here is another and dangerous rapid, with rugged rocks on both sides. South 60, east half mile. Still the same rapid, which is amazing, strong and full of tremendous whirlpools and gulfs that surpass anything of which I could form an idea. South 20, east one quarter mile. Still same rapid. South 35, west one and a half miles. East course. The rapid ends, but the current continues strong. In this last rapid, much water was taken. The canoes often wheeled about, and what rendered our situation more dangerous was not to be able to stop or find a place to put ashore on account of rocks. Southeast one quarter mile, east two third mile. Very pretty and long rapid on right in this course. Southeast one and a half miles. In this course, a sandy irregular banks on right with a strong point on left. Our next course was south 85, east 1, and a third miles. And near the beginning of this course, a small and rapidous river, i.e. Watson Bar Creek, flowed in from the right, and there were several tombs near it, and on that side the hills have a beautiful, irregular appearance, but are very ugly and rocky on the opposite bank. North 70, east 1, and a quarter plus a quarter miles. Southeast 1 and a quarter miles. In this course are sandy banks on right, and there are wood on both sides, in this and last course, and the tops of the mountains of both sides are thinly covered. At end of this last course, the river is amazing wide and but little current, while there is snow on the mountains on left. North 70 east quarter mile. Here is a strong and dangerous rapid, which however we ran down without any accident, but lost time in visiting it, and afterwards in gumming the Perseverance, which got hurt on getting ashore at the lower end. The rocks are high on both sides, and the course is south, 80 east one quarter mile, and south 40 east quarter mile, and there is a good footpath to carry on right, but the hills are steep. I had some trouble in coming up light, and having gone to one side of the path to see the canoes run down, I got my feet full of thistles. This rapid is very near as bad as Rapide Couvert. Our next course was south 55 east one and a quarter miles, south 30 east half mile. In this course are ugly sandy banks on left with extraordinary high and rocky mountains on both sides, particularly on left, south 10 east three quarter mile. Here the river is much contracted, but not near so much as in the bad rapids. The mountains on left is extraordinary high and pointed. Southeast one and a quarter miles. In this course is seemingly very fine, white earth on left, and it is all a rapid but not dangerous. South sixty east one mile. In this course a rocky point on the right projecting into the river which is narrow and forms a strong rapid which continues to the end but is not dangerous, and there is an ugly déboulé i.e. slides, on left with small epinet, i.e. spruce trees, on both sides. Deboule and sandy banks continue on left while we steered southeast another mile, with a beach of round stones on both sides with some small pines and epinet, and in whatever direction I look, whether before or behind, nothing but mountains of a most rugged shape are to be seen. Those on the right, indeed, near the water side is passable, but I never saw any to be compared to those opposite. At end, of course, was Mouton, i.e. sheep, at which the people fired several shots without effect. Neither did he ever stir while we remained in sight, but on putting ashore he went off. South 55, east, one-third mile. In this course is a small rivulet on right, i.e. Leon Creek, with another almost opposite on left. Here the rocks contracted themselves in such a manner as to form the appearance of a violent rapid or cataract, and under these apprehensions we land, I on the left shore, and it being then late, we encamped for the night. Our guide and interpreter, I mean the two Atnas and the Tauten, absolutely wanted to leave us and go on foot to the next nation, which they called Asket this, I, the Lilouet Indians, and which they represent as at no greater a distance off than the Rapide Couvert from here. However, we prevailed upon them to remain with us till tomorrow morning, that we might determine whether it was really possible to continue in Canoe or not. Indeed, by all accounts, we have had yet. 
This is the last place to where we could possibly go with canners, and beyond report says there is no such thing as proceeding either in canoe or on foot, on account of the narrowness of the river, the strong rapids and whirlpools between the perpendicular rocks that come down to the waterside, which renders it impossible to stop the canoes or debark where they stopped. But the truth of this will be better known tomorrow, when people will be purposely sent to visit. The weather was amazing sultry both today and yesterday, and the water from its highest mark has lowered about nine or ten feet perpendicular. Had it continued in the state it was seven days ago, we would have been obliged to leave our canoes far from here. Friday, June 10th Early this morning, La Certe, Bourbonnais, and two others were sent down to visit the river and ascertain the truth of what the Indians told us of it being bad and impossible to continue farther in canoes or not. End of the last journal of Simon Fraser, from May 30th to June 10th, 1808. Thank you for listening. <laughs>